Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, that was so weak. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes, that's what I love to hear. I am Ranger Stephanie, and I'm from a very cool park called Richmond National Battlefield Park. <laughs> And I work for Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site right here in Richmond, Virginia. How many of you guys have heard of Richmond National Battlefield Park or Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site? Okay, a few of you. Awesome. Great. Then the rest of you, guess what? You're going to really get to know it today, I promise. So I'm sure you guys are going to be studying all about the Civil War. Are we not starting that series yet? Just started? Oh, just finished. Oh, then I am like the grand finale of your guys' Civil War talk then. And you guys, have you started talking about Maggie Walker yet? No. Oh, that's coming up too. So you guys definitely have an opportunity to ask me some great questions today. And I hope that maybe um, some of the, my visit today you guys will be able to use in your classroom. So I am Ranger Steph. I work at a really cool place. My office is at Tredegar. I don't know if you guys can see that cool building. It's really old. That building was back during the Civil War. It was part of a place called Tredegar Ironworks, one of the largest ironworks for the Confederacy during the Civil War. So who can tell me what two sides were fighting each other during the Civil War? Ooh, 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 I love all the hands. Yes, ma'am, in the purple. Um, the Union and the Confederacy. The Union and the Confederacy. So if I said these guys were making 1,099 cannons for the Confederacy, is that the North or the South? South, good job guys. You guys, I don't, I don't even need to be here. I am Ranger Steph. I have been a park ranger for 10 years with the National Park Service. So I work across the country. I could work at Grand Canyon. I could work at Yellowstone, Yosemite, um, Acadia National Park in Maine, uh, Shenandoah right here in Virginia. So this is me at Prince William Forest Park. I'm saving an Eastern box turtle from getting squashed. Uh, right there. So my job does involve some animals from time to time. And my job also is a little bit of trail crew. Can you guys see that right there? Yeah. So I do run a chainsaw on occasion um, when there's bad trees down, uh, like a bad storm and trees fall down on the trails. I have to go out and hike with a chainsaw and keep care of all our trails and maintenance for those trails. And we also keep care of the buildings too. So sometimes I have to clean the bathrooms. Ugh. Not a fun job, but guess what? Somebody's got to do it, and I always like to say it's job security, okay? Because if I can clean a bathroom, then they're not going to get rid of me. All right? So there I am. That is me on the trail. Um, I probably hiked in about four miles before cutting, so I had to haul a chainsaw on my back uh, for that long. But I work at some pretty cool battlefields, and all of the battlefields that I'm going to show you today are part of Richmond National Battlefield Park, all part of the American Civil War. So this is the Battle of Gaines Mill. Um, Gaines Mill was a battle in 1862, and it was uh, Robert E. Lee's first victory as commander of the Confederate Army. Who's Robert E. Lee again? You guys know which side he was on? Oh, oh, yes, ma'am. The Confederacy, the North, or the South. So yes, you guys are correct. There's another great picture. We have lots of cannons. We like cannons. More, more Gaines Mill. Let's see if I got another one. Oh, I think that's my last one. Is that my last one? Yeah, so there's our pretty, our cool battlefields. I'm actually gonna go back to this one. Can you guys see that one? Yeah, it's pretty. Isn't that one really pretty? I'm gonna leave that one up. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about the Civil War here today. Um, you guys have already told me there's two sides that are fighting each other, the North and the South, the Union and the Confederacy. These two, um, these two like nations are going to split off from each other. They're going to try, the Confederacy is going to try to start its own nation. And they're going to choose a president for the South, for the Confederacy. Who is going to be the president for the South? Oh, my goodness. I'm loving this. All right. Yes, sir. Jefferson Davis, that is right. Jefferson Davis is going to be elected president for the Confederacy. He is the one and the only president for the Confederacy. And they are going to make their capital where? Where is the capital of the Confederacy? Yes, ma'am. Richmond. Richmond, Virginia. You're absolutely correct. Now, the North. The North is going to select a president. Who is that going to be? 
Okay, I'm coming back over here. Yes, ma'am? Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president. That is absolutely correct. And he's going to have a capital. They're not going to select a new capital. It's going to have been our capital for a very, very long time. Who knows our nation's capital for today? Washington, D.C. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have played capture the flag before. Okay? All right? Capture the flag. You do not put your flag right next to your opponent's flag, right? No. So if we're thinking about Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia, they're only 100 miles apart. This does not seem smart in my mind. There are things... Like they have the, the entire South to choose from. They could have picked their, their capital in Alabama. They could have picked their nation's capital in Florida. They could have put it in Georgia, South Carolina. But Richmond, anybody have an idea why they chose Richmond, Virginia as their capital? Oh, here we go. So it was easier to get to their capital and take it over. Well, that could be, you know, maybe, oh, if we get close enough, we don't have to go so far. There's a few other things Richmond has, we still have today. Because Richmond um, was in the south, so I think that... Okay, it is in the south, yeah? All right. I can see wheels churning. Oh, he's thinking big now. What is that fall line? How do we know what's the water resource that's, that you can see the fall line? It's big. It's a big piece of water that runs right through the downtown Richmond area. Go ahead. Rivers. Yeah, what's the name of the river? <gasps> Phoning a friend. The James River. That is right. So the James River is one of the reasons why Richmond was chosen. One, they could get resources from the mountains, they could get resources from the Chesapeake Bay, but they could also use it as a defense. All they had to do was burn down all the bridges. And guess what? Did they have, could they get across the James River? No, they could, but it would take a while, right? They'd have time. Now, there's these things called factories, industries. What was the North known for? What was the North's economics? <coughs> what was the North's economics? Industrial, factories. How about the South's economics? Oh, everybody. Yes, ma'am. Agriculture, great. Yes, so agriculture was known as the South. So if we were in Georgia, do you think we would have the factories and industries to make things? No. So this is going to sound really, really weird, but I promise it makes sense. Richmond was far enough north in the south that it had factories and industries. It was right on the line, very, very close to having its own economics as, as industry. So if we go back to the picture of Tredegar, Tredegar Ironworks was a very large factory, and that's how they were able to make 1,099 cannons for the south. But Tredegar, let me see if I can go back. Can we go back? Oh, wrong way. Boop, 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 boop. There I am. This building right here is called the Crenshaw Woolen Flour Mill. The Crenshaw Woolen Mill actually made blankets and uniforms for Confederate soldiers in this very building. So they were making things like this. I need a volunteer. Oh, awesome, awesome. Yes, ma'am, come on up. I want you to check this out. Put this on. Awesome. Awesome. Let me pop your hood there. There you go. How's that feel? Yeah. It's warm, right? <laughs> Is it heavy? Yeah. yeah, it's very heavy, isn't it? I need another volunteer. Oh my goodness, yes. Come on up, sir. Come on up. And if I choose somebody that I shouldn't, just uh, give me a holler. All right. All right. Come on up. Put this on. Awesome. Put that on. Great. Now, how does yours feel? Yeah, fairly, fairly light, right? Hers actually has a lining. If you open it up, it actually has a lining on the inside. It's a little heavier. Yours does not have a lining. So do you think it's going to do, uh, do pretty well in the winter? Yeah. No, but her uniform definitely is. Now, which one would have been made at Tredegar? If Tredegar was part of the Confederacy, which one of these uniforms would have been made at Tredegar? Yes, ma'am. And how do you know that? 
Do we need to phone a friend? Totally okay if we need to. All right, phoning a friend up front. Okay, heavier and better. Why? How else could we know? Yes, ma'am. It's colder probably over there. It's probably colder and you have Yeah. You got good thoughts, but it's something about the something about the appearance of this jacket, what it looks like. Yes, ma'am. Oh, um, well, because slaves <coughs> grew cotton, uh -huh. so they had like more what if I told you guys it goes on the color of their jacket? Okay, so in the Confederacy they would have wore a gray color, all right, a gray color, and the Union would have wore blue. Does that make? Yeah, you know, can't be wearing all these wishy-washy colors because then we're going to have a huge problem, right? So. I'm going to talk to you guys about the five deadliest items of the Civil War, starting with these uniforms right here. How do you guys feel about volunteering now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're a little nervous now, but don't don't worry. I promise they ha they are perfectly fine. Nothing's going to happen. We will all make it to lunch. Okay, and that I know that's important. Okay, so here we go. You two have on these uniforms. During the Civil War, soldiers would be wearing a uniform, just like I wear a uniform every day. It kind of distinguishes me from other people. I know what side I work on. I work on the National Park Service side. These guys, they know she's going to be fighting for the Confederacy, and he's going to be fighting for the Union. Now, there was a gentleman named Stonewall Jackson. Oh, yes, are we, we know his name, right? He stood like a stone wall at the Battle of Manassas, right? So here's Stonewall Jackson. He is going to be at a place called Chancellorsville in Fredericksburg, Virginia. How many of you guys have heard of Fredericksburg? Oh, good, 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 good. Okay, hands down. So here at the Battle of Fredericksburg, Stonewall Jackson is going to decide he's gonna ride his horse across the open battlefield in the evening time, right at dusk. It's going to be a little cool outside, so he decides to change his jacket. So he decides to change his jacket from this grayish color to another jacket that's a little longer, a little heavier, and darker gray. So as he rides across to the battlefield, he gets shot. Shot by his own men because they thought his uniform looked blue. So during the Civil War, you could be shot by your own people if you didn't even have the correct uniform color on. So that's one of the deadliest ways you can die using in your uniform. Also, these uniforms, are you getting hot still? Yeah, yeah she's like, yes, I'm hot. So your uniform's pretty hot. Yeah. Is it a hot day outside today? No, no it's fairly cool. Um, but think about summer, June, July. Are you going to feel hot then? Yeah. Oh, very hot. There's something called heat stroke or heat exhaustion. Yeah. You guys have heard of this? Yeah. Soldiers would get heat exhaustion or heat stroke from wearing their wool uniforms because when you went into battle, you did not take off your jacket, right? Because we didn't want to end up like Stonewall Jackson. So here they are going into battle. Imagine running and just charging at people wearing this heavy, heavy jacket. Imagine you're wearing pants that are the same material, the same weight. It's all made out of wool. So these are wool uniforms. I don't know about you guys. I'm not a fashionista. You know, I don't know anything about fashion, obviously. But I can tell you guys, I do not wear wool in the summer, right? Is that like a golden rule? You don't wear wool in the summer? All right. Same thing here. These guys, they want to wear, they don't want to wear their wool uniforms, and so they'll try to take them off. But when they're in battle, they get heat exhaustion because they have to wear these uniforms. Can everybody give a round of applause to my two volunteers? Thank you. I'm going to take this back. Oh, you feel, oh yeah, nice and warm. Woo. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Pretty neat. I promised you two you would make it to lunch, okay? I promised. The next thing I'm going to talk about, since we're talking about uniforms, 
is what soldiers wore on their feet. Who has socks like these on today? Nobody? Oh, some people do? Yeah? No? Not these? These big socks? These are wool socks hand-knitted by women during the Civil War. They would sit in um, knitting circles or have little groups that would knit socks for the soldiers as they go off to war. Um, these socks soldiers would wear normally. They're made out of wool, so do you think their feet are going to get hot and sweaty? Yes. Oh, definitely. So they're going to have these socks on. Sometimes you get a blowout. That's what I call these when you wore them too much. And then they're going to wear these awesome shoes. And you're thinking to me, Ranger Steph, you told me we were going to talk about the deadliest items. All right. These would kill me if I had to wear them because they're ugly. But this is not church. These are the boots that they would wear. So these boots, they have no traction on the bottom. So if you guys looked at the bottom of your shoes, we all have traction on the bottom of our shoes today. That's to prevent slips, trips, and falls. Okay. So here we are. We have these shoes, no traction on them. We have nails holding the bottom of the heels on. Some of you guys can see these little round nails in there. Yeah, so we have nails holding those on. How many of you guys have nails in your shoes right now? No, none of you. Yeah, there's this stuff called glue. Yeah, it's, most of our shoes are glued together. And then we have the inside, no padding. Hard as a rock on the inside, there's no padding. No padding. Soldiers are going to be marching in these boots for 10 to 15 miles a day. Marching 10 to 15 miles a day in these shoes. Now remember, you have these awesome socks on as well. And you only probably have one or two pairs of socks with you. Yeah, there's not a washing machine or anything nearby, so you're probably going to be having some stinky feet. But these shoes, oh, I forgot to mention the, the coolest part about these shoes. You don't have to worry about what foot you put it on because they go, there's no such thing as a right or left foot. No right or left foot. That's why it has a square toe on the end. So it could go on either foot. Now, when soldiers would put their shoes on or when they were given shoes, when they came into training camp, their shoes were only full sizes or whole sizes, I like to say. So there's no half size. So there's no four and a half, five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half. You would have to go up a shoe size. So you'd only have to do like five, six, seven, eight, and so on. So now you're wearing shoes that are too big for your feet. You have big, big socks on and you're marching 10 to 15 miles a day. As they march, soldiers are going to get this thing on the back of their heel. Uh, what? A blister, that's right, man, them things. They hurt, right? So you're going to get a blister on the back of your foot. And the soldiers, they didn't have a first aid kit with them. They didn't have a Band-Aid back then, all right, to put on there. They're going to continue to march. And then all of a sudden, it's going to pop. Ugh, it's rough. Do you think they're going to go to the doctor and say, hey, doc, I got a boo-boo? Are they going to do that? No, they're soldiers. They're going to march on. So they're going to try to take care of it themselves, try to, you know, push something, maybe a piece of uh, extra fabric in there they tore off their shirt, or maybe they're going to use a piece of wool off their uniform and put that in there to give their heel a little bit more protection, and then they're going to keep marching again. Yeah, but these socks, remember this thing I said we had a blowout? Oh, yeah, they're pretty worn out. So now we're marching again, and we got this blister that's popped and it's going to get this thing, it's going to get real red and irritated. It's called an infection. Oh man, an infection. At this point, they have to go to the doctor. And so now I go back to the doctor. I'm like, doc, I can't, I can't walk. This, this thing is infected. And they didn't have the medicine that we have today in order to fight off the simplest infection from a blister. And so that infection gets in his bloodstream. And as he continues to march on, he's going to start to get sick. And then eventually it's going to get in his bloodstream and he is going to die from an infection. Just from marching. Just from marching. Just from this little itty bitty thing called a blister. All right. All of that just from a little blister. So how many of you guys, when your mom says, or your dad or your aunt and uncle is somebody who takes you shoe shopping and they say stand up let me feel where your toe is are you guys going to listen to them now 
Yeah, because you don't want it to come and get you, the deadly shoe, right? All right. Okay. So there's deadly item number two. Um, let's talk about deadly item number three. This thing. It is a cannonball. Very good. It is a cannonball. Don't worry. Don't worry, adults in the room. It's a solid iron cannonball. If I dropped it, it would just hurt my toe. All right. Also attached to the back of this normally would be gunpowder. For today's purposes, it's kitty litter. Okay. <laughs> so safety first and fresh step. All right. So this is a 12 pound solid iron cannonball. It's just like a bowling ball. If you can imagine a bowling ball going flying through the air, does a bowling ball explode on impact? Man, bowling would be so much more fun. But no, it does not explode on impact. This is going to keep going until something harder stops it. This is representing all of the cannons and all of the muskets, all the guns that the soldiers would have been carrying. How would you guys, how would somebody die from this? How would somebody die from a cannonball? Yes, ma'am, in blue. They would, huh? Oh, yeah, gunpowder. How else? Yes, it hits them. They get hit by it. They get shot at. Definitely. So we all know that this can kill people, right? Yes, as much as we like to joke around about this 12-pound solid iron cannonball, it was designed to kill and harm people. So yes, this thing I'm going to put back down because it weighs 14 and a half pounds with all that on there. That's how I keep in shape. All right. Then we'll go to a lighter thing. Woo! Okay. Yes. It is a type of water bottle. It has a special name. Anybody know the special name? Yes, sir. Yeah. Close. Very close. We're getting there. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. A canteen, very good. This is a canteen. Now, do we fill our canteen with Mountain Dew? No. Really? Okay. So we don't fill this with canteen, a canteen with Mountain Dew. What do we fill it with? Water. Water. Excellent. During the Civil War, we would pull up to Aquafina, right, and let them fill it up or pull in springs. No. Oh, really? No. Where do I fill this up at? Where do I fill my canteen up at? Yes, sir the river or a stream. That is right. So I'm going to go down to a stream and I'm going to fill up my water bottle and then, or my canteen I should say, and I'm going to drink it and then, oh you look thirsty, I better share with you, and you look thirsty sir, so I'm going to share with you, then I'm going to drink a little more. Uh oh. Oh what, what did I do wrong? Sharing is caring. No? Yeah? I'm passing on germs. Oh, sorry guys, I like was really sick with the flu last week, so hate to tell ya. So germs, that's right, okay. Also, all of a sudden my stomach's going gurgle, gurgle. I got what I call the thunder down under. And I've got to go to the bathroom a lot. What else is in the water that I can't see? What else is in the water that I can't see? Yes, ma'am, in the gray. Um, bacteria. Bacteria, that is absolutely correct. There are things in the water that we can't see with our eyes. How many of you guys run down to a stream or a river and get a big old cup and drink it? Nobody. None of you. Yeah, no. It's just not going to happen. Okay, maybe. Oh, maybe. Okay. A little bit, yeah. You gotta be careful because soldiers here are drinking a lot of water that have bad bacteria in it. See, there's this thing called a watershed. Ooh, how many of you guys have heard of a watershed before? And it's not the place where I store my Aquafina and pull in springs, okay? So what is a watershed? Who can tell me what a watershed is? Who can tell me what a watershed is? No, you guys are all gonna learn something about a watershed. This is what I like to call interpretive dance, all right? So a watershed is the area of land, so everybody go like this, area of land in which water sheds to a common point. So when it rains, which way does water flow, uphill or downhill? So if I was standing uphill from the James River, where would my water go to? 
Into what water? So I'm part of the James River watershed, right? Yeah. So a watershed really has nothing to do with water until it has everything to do with the land. So soldiers here didn't understand that cows were going doo-doo up on top of the hill. When it rained, the water flowed down into the stream. And when they filled up their canteen, ew is right, folks. They get the sickies, all right? And so now they're going to go over to the doctor and the doctor, and they're going to be like, dude, I'm so sick. And so he's going to give me these two chalky pills, and then he's going to tell me to drink more water. Oh, my goodness. It just keeps going, right? And it, these, these men, they start to get worse and worse and worse until they're so weak they can't even get up. They can't march anymore. They have to be sent to a hospital and eventually die. die from diseases that they have gotten. Yes, so what do you guys think about water now? It's disgusting during the Civil War, but we all need it in order to survive, right? Food, shelter, and water. Oh, did somebody say food? Oh, yes, food. I'm going to get you guys all ready for lunch, I promise. <laughs> During the Civil War, soldiers had all different types of food that they can choose from to eat. It was very limited, though, on what exactly they were given. They could choose what they were going to eat, whether they went out and forged it or went and found it themselves, or whether the army provided it for them. So the first food I want to show you is this stuff right here. Now, the Ziploc bag would not have been here during the Civil War, but the stuff inside was. What was the South economics again? Agriculture. So anybody have a guess why the Confederacy was eating this and what this is? What is this? Take a closer look at it. Yeah, type of, yeah, close to a grain, yeah, yep. Yeah. Maybe uh, the slaves at the farm of the Confederacy made some, like, maybe had some kind of crop and like munched it together. Okay, you're going more. They have a crop and they did smash it up. What do you think this is, sir, right here? Wheat? Not wheat. Corn. corn. It's corn meal. How many of you guys have had the ooey gooey delicious cornbread? Oh, I love me some cornbread with a big bowl of chili. Awesome. So here we have cornbread, right? You're thinking, ooh, cornmeal's not that bad, except for the fact you don't have eggs and you don't have milk. But they did have this stuff called salt pork. Let's all think of bacon for a second. Ooh, bacon. Yes, when we cook bacon and we fry it over an open fire, there's this stuff called grease that comes out. Do we eat the grease? No. no, we get rid of it. Some of us save it, some of us get rid of it. The soldiers are actually going to save their fat left over from salt pork. Now it's called salt pork because it is soaked in salt to preserve it. They didn't have these, these chemicals we have today to preserve our food. So they're gonna have salt. And when they cook it, they're gonna have this fat that's left over and hopefully a lot of salt is in that fat. Now they'll cut off some chunks of that fat that they have saved for a few days and they're going to pour in the cornmeal. Get it nice and hot and they're going to flatten it until it becomes really, really, really fat like a pancake. <coughs> then they're going to pick it up and eat it. Sounds pretty good, right? Sounds like a corn pancake. Except for the fact it's going to taste really salty because of what they cooked it in. Now, some soldiers would even roll their cornmeal in that fat until it became out like a ball. How many of you guys have had a hush puppy? Oh. Yeah, that is cornmeal rolled in grease, okay? So there you go, the hot hush puppy. So there you go, they would eat it and it would be a salty taste. And then what is something you wanna do when you get something salty? And we're all back to this again, all right? So this was not a fun meal to have, but it was definitely filling. The North had a different type of food that they were given. Yeah. 
This is called hardtack, obviously. It's hard as a rock. Yes, this is how they were given it. This is their way that they preserve their food. This is just flour and water and salt cooked at a very low temperature for a very long time. It is, it, it basically is like a cracker or a piece of bread. Now soldiers, they're gonna have to try to eat this. So of course, one of the nicknames they're gonna give this food is tooth dollar or tooth buster. Cause if you tried to bite into it, you're gonna bust a tooth off. And you only had, two, only had to have two teeth in order to join the military back then. And so some people didn't qualify. Okay, so appreciate our dental hygiene we have today. <laughs> so these soldiers, they are gonna have coffee. So here's some coffee beans. All right. So these are some coffee beans. They're gonna make coffee over an open fire. No Starbucks then, okay? So they're gonna, I know, man, the whipped cream. So here we go, they're gonna heat it up over an open fire. They're gonna drop their hard tack in. Now, the second nickname of this is called worm castles. See, your food is not wrapped in plastic. You have little cloth baggies that your food is in. Your lunch pail or your sack that would hold your rations for a week is only in here. That holds all your food for a week. Some of you, that will not hold your lunch, okay? So this is for a week. Week of food is in here. You are camping on, a gr on the ground every single night. And there's other things that want to eat too. And those are little worms. So as you drop this in, your coffee's nice and hot. There's gonna be a few worms that crawl out. Because it's so hot, they're trying to get away from the hot. The worms get in here because there's no preservatives, there's nothing keeping it out. You're, you have cloth bag, cloth, another little cloth baggie. There's no plastic. And this is your rations for a week, so you're not just going to throw these away. But now that you pull it out of your coffee, all the worms are out, and now this is nice and soft, and you can bite into it. And also, it's like a soggy piece of bread. Who's had like a soggy peanut butter and jelly sandwich before? Oh, it's not the funnest, all right? Except this has no jelly flavor. It's gonna taste like coffee. For some of us, that's great. For others, it is not the best taste ever, all right? So here we are, we're able to eat it. And now I need to be able to wash it down with worms and all. That's right, folks, because soldiers had limited access to meat. This was just an extra source of protein for them. Some soldiers would write in letters and in their journals that they rather eat at night than during the day so they didn't have to see what they were eating. Now, fruits and vegetables, not in their diet. No, because, because they didn't have those resources. They would say that if they came across an apple tree, the apple tree was picked completely bare. Even the rotten apples that were on the ground were picked up and ate. Soldiers had limited access to even an apple. So, how many of you guys are excited to eat whatever's served for lunch today? All right, good, good. Now, so how would your food kill you? Oh, worms, you know, you don't know what's gonna be in your food. Also, you're eating, you're eating something salty that's making you drink more water, which we found out could be potentially bad. And then we also know that they didn't have access to, to certain vegetables, so they couldn't even, uh, fruits and vegetables, so they couldn't even fight off like the common cold. They weren't getting the vitamins and nutrients that our body needs. That's why we all have like that, that pyramid now. You guys know the food pyramid? Yeah, there was none of that. It was just a line. All right, they only had that. All right, we're gonna do a little vote. I feel like you guys are prepared to vote. I'm gonna see if you guys ha know which of these is the deadliest item of them all. Which of these items killed the most people during the Civil War? You can only vote one time. I'm gonna raise them up and you guys can vote. Who thinks that the uniform heat exhaustion killed the most people? Oh, none of you, all right. How many of you guys think the cannonball killed the most people or a musket?
cannonball or musket. All right. The tribe has spoken. You have voted. All right. How many think the canteen has killed the most people? Okay, lots more hands. Awesome. How many think these shoes? These would kill me if I had to wear them. All right. All right, we got a few people. Awesome. How many think the food? Another item that Ranger Steph would die from. Okay, a few of you. Are we ready? I'd like to do a drum roll on your thighs for me, please. Oh, which one is it? Oh, the canteen, the water. Water killed the most people during the Civil War. More than any bullet or any musket or any cannon killed. Um, why? It's because we need water every day in order to survive. Um, germ theory was not discovered until after the Civil War when a surgeon had decided to start cleaning his tools in between surgeries. Yeah, that sounds lovely, doesn't it? Yeah, it wasn't until then did they find out that there was, a, that there was this idea of infections and germs and they were spreading that. So here he cleaned his utensils and that's how we learned about germ theory. So how many of you guys are like, it's flu season, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer, right? Yeah, so they didn't have a clue about that then. And now today, even still, we're trying to improve ways to stop sharing germs with everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is concluding my Civil War talk with you today. I will take a few questions and then I have one more surprise for you guys that your teachers don't even know about uh, today. <gasps> surprise! All right, okay, just a couple questions. Ma'am, you've been waiting patiently. Yes. They don't have sugar or creamer for coffee. Yeah, that is bad. In my world, that it, the whipped cream is the important part. Yes, ma'am. Ah, she's asking, did they have spoons or forks? Yes, they would have spoons or forks, but those were considered a luxury item. They would be eating most of the time with their digits. Okay. Yep, yeah, they would be able to pick food up and eat it. Oh, we have a teacher question. Yes. Um, were all shoes like that back then or just the Civil War shoes? Most of the, most of the shoes for soldiers were because they had to produce them for everyone. So they kind of made it like a generic like print and that was the cut that they cut out because they had to make so many uh, very fast. So most shoes back then did they didn't have tread? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, none of them had tread. It was just a hard leather bottom. So slips, trips, and falls were definitely a huge part of the Civil War. Another teacher question. In relation to that, what did you study in college to be a park ranger? Ooh, great question. So I actually started in law enforcement. So I studied conservation law enforcement. How many of you guys have heard of the show Northwoods Law? Anybody here in Northwoods Law? So I went to school with half of those guys on the show. So I studied in Unity College in Maine. I studied conservation law enforcement and thought I wanted to be a law enforcement ranger. And then I said, uh-uh, it's not for me. I went into interpretation and education and went back to school for my master's in outdoor education. And now I'm here as the education coordinator for two national parks. So there you go. Yes. Oh, um, what did the soldiers wear what they didn't need or carry? Great question. What did they need wear? Let me see if I got something in my cool box of stuff. And no, I guess I don't have it. They would actually wear like a like a cloth or cotton shirt and wool pants. I do have the wool pants. So these are the pants they would wear. If you guys if you guys look, there is no zipper. It's oh, buttons. Oh, no. And there's no belt loops. So it's one size fits most. Wait, wait. Oh, Mark. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah, perfect, she found it in the trunk. So yeah, this is what soldiers would wear underneath their jackets. Once again, one size fits most. All right, I'm gonna take one more question. Oh, well, he's getting all technical on me. Yeah, so that's the thing, is if it's too much of infection is in your bloodstream, you don't have, you, that's when we need things like amoxicillin or penicillin and things like that, things they didn't know, they didn't have at the time. Awesome. So ladies and gentlemen, like I said, thank you so much. Friends, 